live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. It is Thursday, August 20th, 2020. Time to get to the uh, lottery store, I suppose. And uh, I don't know, win enough money to uh, hang around in post-apocalyptic America and have, uh, have uh, no influence whatsoever. I, I guess you can sit on a pile of money or sit under a pile of money uh, when everything comes crashing down. Maybe that will offer you some protection. In the meantime, uh, I guess you can get some luxury items to sit with through the apocalypse. Anyway, we don't really need to speak about things that way. There's plenty more, of course, to round up. Greg Dworkin will be here shortly to help us do that. It was night three of the convention. Big names coming out, making the big speeches. Uh, Night four still to come. Bigger names still. And, of course, the nomination and acceptance speech of... Joe Biden, who, as it turns out, is the Democratic nominee, or at least will be. Later tonight, I guess he is now. He was officially uh, named during the call of the states that we enjoyed so much during the second night. That's right. Uh, But the speech is what will make it official. Not really. The the vote made it official. But the speech will cement it in the minds of most people. Uh, So big night for him to uh, declare... uh, Uh, what it is he's running for, what it's all about, what his vision is for America, et cetera, et cetera. But, of course, uh, if you're not into that, how about uh, getting rid of Trump will be enough for you. Maybe that will excite you. Plenty to round up, as I said, from yesterday's speeches. Great ones from Kamala Harris. Uh, Oh, and were we not uh, very well prepared for that moment during her speech in which she uh, called out and thanked her Alpha Kappa Alpha Sisters and the Divine Nine, which we learned a lot about yesterday in speaking with Denise Oliver Velez. Thanks very much for coming on and and giving us that background and insight into what was going on. We all kind of felt like uh, insiders, well, if not in, exactly insiders, that we knew at least what the hell was going on. Maybe you were caught by surprise by other parts of the speech, but uh, luckily, if you have a nice, diverse timeline on Twitter or lots of friends who can inform you. You might have uh, had a chance to to catch up uh, probably after the fact, if you're like me, about uh, who else she was calling out. I I did notice uh, a great deal of excitement about her call out to uh, using a term that, uh, well, escapes me offhand, but it looked like chitties or something quite like that. Uh, We'll have to check in on that with our our neighborhood linguists, but uh, this part I do remember watching as Indian Americans uh, re- rejoiced in seeing th- th- or hearing that called out. Apparently, that's the uh, terminal. And was it in Tamil? Is that right? The language that she was using there um, to call out to her Indian aunties, as they like to say. I have the, uh, of course, unfortunate East Coast New Jersey-ish accent that makes me pronounce A-U-N-T, or want to pronounce A-U-N-T as aunt, as opposed to aunt. But, uh, you know, just a close familial relationship call out there in in a way a coded in language that was meant to uh, reach out to, grab hold of, and include, for the first time in such a speech, the Indian American term, uh, uh, folks who are listening. Yes, okay, right. And I see at the same time, confusing my uh, speech here, the note from Greg bringing that up. Yeah, the uh, is it is Tamil, so we've got that correct too. And that's a nice call out too. It's good to get the, the language correct. Uh, Greg's got all the quotes here that he can share with us. And uh, in the meantime, let's see. Other things that came up. Oh, I don't know if you noticed. Former President of the United States Barack Obama also have had a little speech in there. Uh, it was a very big speech, and in fact, a lot, of, a considerable amount. Of, I was paying attention to this, having an ear for this. Now, uh, when I sometimes edit the uh, the shows or edit people's submissions for the shows for time, uh, I begin to notice how big the silence gaps occasionally are in between sentences. And sometimes it's uh, intentional for emphasis, which was the case with a lot of what Obama was saying. He was That was the unspoken 
let that sink in. You can't really put that. It doesn't sound very presidential when you put that in your speech. But he was saying a lot of things that, of course, needed to be allowed to sink in. And his silences were there for that point. Although it did occur to me with the big fights over how much time people were allotted to speak for this reason or that reason, uh, you could have fit another whole uh, congressional member of Congress could have spoken in the silences that Obama got to occupy. But, you know, one, it's a rhetorical uh, device that he makes great use of. And two, he's the former president and he gets the time. So lots of great... uh, interest in 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 his speech in her speech and i think everybody knows which of the two speeches we're talking about i don't even have to name names um big night i think everybody agrees that it went pretty well uh, donald trump uh reacted i think as predicted i mean it, it was as if well actually i guess it was as if hillary clinton was entirely right when she said that donald trump was somebody the reason you couldn't trust him as president was that he was somebody who could be manipulated with a tweet uh these weren't tweets, of course. These were speeches, uh, but uh, calculated to elicit these reactions, and they did. Trump was sitting there watching television all night, uh, along with the rest of us. I mean, at least we all elected to do the same thing. That was the first time we've been on the same page in a long time. Uh, but, of course, he reacted with angry, all-caps, rage tweets, and they took note of that in if you watched the convention on any of the channels that uh, afterwards offered up commentary – as I did, I just flipped on uh, CNN just to see what was going on. And uh, yeah, well, they noticed uh, and they spent a lot of time analyzing the fact that the president was sitting there rage tweeting. In fact, uh, Anderson Cooper actually called out, called him out at one point saying, you know, th- th- not only can uh, Trump not ever give a speech like the one that Barack Obama gave, but the best he can do in terms of communication with the country is to to tweet to sit on the toilet tweeting. He actually called that out, tweeting from the bathroom, and he probably got a hundred percent right there. All right, well, Greg is here. Skype worked the first time because I remembered to run the uh, pre-show test, so that's good news. We'll celebrate it by uh, allowing him to talk. Good morning, Greg. Hey, why why would we do that? I don't know. Uh, seemed like the thing to do at the time. So, you know, for those of you who are uh, goal-oriented, uh, there's four days until the Republican National Convention starts and 40 days until the first presidential debate and 48 days until the vice presidential debate and 56 days until the second presidential debate and 63 until the third and 75 wow. days until the election. And for those of you who are... Uh, you know, more uh, task oriented, oh, just, you know, okay. do it. And if we're going to describe the convention yesterday, sure. I mean, so many people saw it, you know, basically they said what you thought they were going to say. And that thing really worked, you know, and you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. OK. You know, it's it's interesting in just so many different ways. Now, my overarching theory of yes. the convention is also the overarching theory to me of the election. Okay, that seems convenient. That that is to say, you're looking for a theme. People are trying to say, well, they talked about this. um, You know, they're going for Republicans on day one or day two. And then on day three, it was all this diversity and how are they going to tie it together? And and, uh, you know, and and uh, then how is Joe Biden going to, you know, meet the mark? Well, it depends what mark. You know, uh, according to the Republicans, okay. he can barely make it out of his own basement by himself. And, you know, uh, according to the uh, the the regular uh, pundits, well, you know, after Obama, I don't, you know, it's, uh, but really all of this is just trying to present yourself as a sane alternative to what's going on. And the messaging in the convention and the subsequent campaign is if you didn't vote in 2016, you made a mistake, but you can rectify it by voting this time and voting for me. Okay. And so everything they're saying is some sort of, uh, you know, variation on that. Now, Hillary Clinton was uh, pretty much upfront about it. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's fascinating to look at. So let's just take a look at the, the convention itself uh, yeah, you already alluded to, and yes, thank you for Denise for being on yesterday and explaining to us. Uh, this is Keith Boykin tweeting, probably the first time AKA and the Divine Nine were mentioned in a Democratic convention speech from a party nominee. 
and oh, uh, yeah, that's probably I true. Know them, sure. Yeah. But you know, at least we. Yeah, you're right. We at least knew what that was. We were all like, "Oh yeah, we're all." Yeah, we, we know now. what that is. Um, but not to pretend that we're subject matter experts on it. The niece is. We're not. We're just clued in because we asked. Yes, we were just saying. I heard those words. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, unless you've an tried, we, said we Seward Stevens, to lot. fill four nights in which everybody knows what's going to happen before it does. Uh, it might be hard for you to realize what a hell of a thing that the, the DNC has pulled off. They reinvented the event. They produced a phenomenal amount of video. They made it work. Good so content. well done, Stephanie Cutter. Yeah. I guess that's who we get to thank for this. Right. Or uh, just a comment to write after that. Uh, uh, Risa Feely won. They brought the nominating convention into the 21st century. I thought it was fantastic. It felt personal, but not small. It was expansive and it was remarkable. And what you had, because of the lack of crowds, you didn't have interruptions, mm. and you had the people speaking looking directly in camera to you in your living room or sure. dining room or kitchen or, you know, uh, uh, Trump flotilla or wherever it is you're watching it from, <laughs> you your can. houseboat. Uh, and it was very personal in that sense, in the way that television can, and the visuals are everything in TV. You know, you might hear what they're saying. You might remember what they're saying, but you read the Chiron on the bottom and that's what you remember. Or you remember the backdrop. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't remember the exact words of the guy from Rhode Island, but there was this play to calamari and this big guy telling you you better eat it or whatever. He didn't even have to say it. He didn't. It's the visual. That's the whole point. And and so, you know, what's the visual? The visual is everybody. It's a big country. And the beautiful, stunningly uh, well-produced videos of showing this country and showing everybody there uh, just plain work. Now, people don't watch these things. Uh, certainly viewership on the regular channels is down compared to uh, four years ago, but they're kind of missing the point that digital is up. I still don't have the digitals in 2016, but the fact that they're up is stated by the campaign that we got you know, t- uh, 10 million people. It's not clear that 10 million people watched streaming or online four years ago it was it was a totally different thing yeah. so expecting this to be uh you know the walter cronkite convention and david brinkley and all the the balloons are going to drop i mean i've got a lot of friends uh, twitter friends acquaintances uh you know people i follow people follow me talking about this who were sort of semi-insulted the first night but got over it because i said you know the old fart pundits are really just they can't stand hmm. change and so they're well, I miss the balloon drops. I miss the in person roll call. Nobody misses the in person roll call. Not anymore. Uh, Not anymore. This, one this was is great. great. Yeah. This is like one of the highlights of the convention. We'll see what the Republicans can do to match it next week. But, you know, it did the job. And the fact that people are watching online and not watching on television, hmm. cable, whatever, is part of 2020 America. Get used to it. You know, plus, of course, the people that don't watch are just going to learn about it from the headlines the next day. So if they read that the production, uh, you know, uh, uh, aesthetics were terrific is is what they'll take away. And then they'll see the little clip on uh, YouTube. And that's how people get the news. That's how I get it. That's how everybody gets it. So I don't know who you were watching before you turned to CNN. I was watching MSNBC Mm -hmm. because having on several other nights tried all the other stations. uh, uh, C-SPAN doesn't do high def. So I like seeing nice, sharp images. And MSNBC made the executive editorial decision to just play the convention. And the only time that they would speak is they might interrupt to say, okay, here's what's coming next for about 30 seconds. And then that's about it. So they played everything except for Jennifer Hudson's uh, uh, piece, musical piece. Hmm. Uh, But you saw and then, you know, staying watching it. Then we had the analysis afterwards. And, and again, one, one of my favorite people, they had Rachel Maddow, they had uh, Joy Breed, and they had Nicole Wallace, who were so properly socially distanced that you couldn't have all three of them on the screen at the same time unless you took a wide shot that looked like a football stadium. Yeah, so I would like to have seen it. Uh, and they were great, but Nicole Wallace was just fantastic. And especially in... Uh, analyzing Obama's speech. Hmm. She stepped back and said, you know, having been in the White House, the visceral anger and fury and frustration 
at being a president and watching somebody dismantle your country uh, yeah. and basically calling the intelligence community Nazis, which is what he did, hmm. you know, Yeah. and uh, going to the CIA and standing in front of the, the wall of stars and, and uh, making it about yourself, the fury that people who care about what they're doing just came out in his speech. And what I thought happened is that Obama properly conveyed a sense of uh, warning, of, of uh, you know, uh, rumbling anxiety about what was going on here, followed by Kamala Harris doing hope. And, and I thought it worked yeah. just fine. And it wasn't a question of comparing her speech to his speech. Uh, he is a very practiced uh, you know, a uh, speech giver, he more than anybody else in the entire convention so far seems to have mastered the pauses that you need when you don't have a crowd. Yes. He didn't rush well, through the speech. He did it slowly with pauses. It was perfect. And then Kamala crowd. had this speech in front of what would be a stadium uh, or, or a, a crowd or, an, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a venue which would have a ton of people and they actually pulled back a little bit and saw that there was only a few people that she was speaking to mm -hmm. and I saw the old fart critic saying oh that didn't work that was a mistake actually it wasn't it conveyed the whole idea that this is really going on and it's because of the pandemic and they don't have to say it they don't have to push that right in your mm -hmm. face everybody knows life is different because of the pandemic and this was yet another different way of just reinforcing the fact that real stuff is going on yeah. So I thought that the whole night worked great. I thought uh, I, I love the roll call. I don't think anything's going to replace that. But uh, I thought last night with Gabby Giffords, who was just tugging at your hearts and then uh, domestic violence and then talking about, uh, you know, I immigration and, and how that fits in. Plus a big chunk on climate, which you never really see in the Democratic convention or any other convention. You're not going to see it from the Republicans who wanted, no, you know, never. drill in Anwar. I mean, it, it was good. It was the, the Democratic constituency last night, whereas it was the Republican, I want you to vote for us constituency, uh, uh, perhaps on other nights. But again, the overarching thing isn't so much, uh, I want you uh, Republicans, and now I want you Democrats, and we're a big tent. It's more like, look, all of you who didn't vote, just get off whoever your, your uh, uh, party is, whatever your different reasoning is, just get off the sidelines and get involved. And here's your permission structure. Yesterday it was for Republicans. Today it's for Democrats. Uh, it's, you know, for a younger audience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just do it. <clears throat> All right. I think we should. I mean, I, I think they they figured correctly we would respond to this. <laughs> and, and we did. Yeah, it was a, a well done everything. So I think a lot of people were very happy with the way it came off last night. And the speeches were good ones. Uh, I guess we could enough. I mean, I, I didn't expect to be ones. watching for two hours every night for four nights, but I find myself, you know what? It's a pretty good TV show. I am. Yeah, well, the TV, I watched for the first time on Plus TV. Plus the commercials. Yesterday. Yeah, that was true. That was helpful. Uh, the names were big enough that uh, that my, my wife got interested, and that meant the TV could be on instead of watching on, uh, on the laptop. Although... Uh, she didn't watch all the speeches. That's true. But when the big names came out, she wanted to see what they had to say. And a lot of people kind of, you know, wrapped up. We had some evening meetings to take care of. Everyone wanted them wrapped up so that they could go and uh, turn on a TV. And say, what is what is Barack Obama is coming back? What's he going to say about this lunatic? Yeah. And, and you know, now? that speech was pretty phenomenal in so many different ways. And for those of you who saying, you know, it's unprecedented for one president to attack his, pre you know, is is. Uh, is another president like that? Trump tweets. Have you ever seen him tweet about uh, Obama? Yeah, well, that's obviously. Yeah. I mean, come on. Don't don't, don't give me that crap. That is, I guess that counts as precedent as much as we'd like to deny that he's the, the president, president has been said for three and a half years. Shut up. Yeah. Uh, that's what I mean about and, the old forts not liking change. And of course, uh, yeah, I mean the attacks have. Been, it's never been quite like this, but you know. Uh, or, or here's another one. Here's here's one of your favorites good. and my favorites too. All right. Daniel Dale. Yes. Right. Daniel Dell is watching the convention. And then after a while, he sure. tweets out something to the, you know, words to the effect. I'm not quoting him exactly. You're all watching me. I'm watching this. But you have to understand it's just different. I can't do this fact checking thing with the Democratic convention the way I do it with Trump. It's well, just it an work. order of magnitude different. There's like nothing to talk about here.
Yeah, I mean, and I'm sure that there were probably Republicans saying, uh, you know, he's biased. Why doesn't he? Why doesn't he fact check? When well, you know, Glenn he, Kessler had his usual fact checking. I, I'll find some picky yeah, right, thing yeah. that has nothing to do with anything, just Obama to show that I'm fair and, that and balanced. Trump's you know, but fact checking does not work in sure. the age of Trump the way it used to with Politifact and Fact Checker and all that sort of stuff. Not how it works. They're yeah. going to lie in your face, and there's nothing that you can well, say or do that's going to change your mind. You can't shame them. And so what are you doing? And so, well, we'll do the other side because the they'll soldier. respond. Well, then you're being biased yourself. Uh, yeah, well, also, it's just those aren't the kinds of speeches that are going to contain. It's not going to be fact-based kind of speech from you – know, why would Barack Obama talk about uh, you know the, the details, the statistics, and how many anythings have happened? He's not the president anymore. He's going to yeah. be talking purely about uh, – People's uh, well, emotions. Michelle got the number of dead wrong. You see, I've run oh, rings about you, and I proved it. Well, come on, you know, yeah. it just it's, it totally misses the point. Well, that but, but although that was an astounding moment that uh, Trump fact checked her, and well, I, I he, you know, he was the perfect that. example of why it doesn't work to do that. I, so uh, anyway, so done, there's that. But but let's step back it. and look at the bigger picture here, because we always like to step back and look at the bigger picture, except when we're you know honing in and looking at the smaller picture. Uh, um, but we got two sure. hours to fill, so we got to do one or the other. This is uh, National Journal, Josh Crashour. Okay. And uh, I'm going to give you a trio back, here, uh, okay. maybe, maybe four if we have time. Or otherwise, we'll do it after the break. But uh, this one is uh, Biden's convention message sounds a lot like Hillary's. Oh. The Democratic Party is again appealing wow. to anti-Trump Republicans, wow. but isn't doing much to woo the working class Obama-Trump voters who defected in 2016. Sort of has a point. You could say that's why Sherrod Brown and not John Kasich should have been the, uh, the, the you know, speaker. Mm. But uh, within the article, uh, he makes what I think is a, is a bigger and more important point. Democrats are betting with lots of polling to back them up that the pandemic and resulting economic disruption will automatically move enough of these working class Obama Trump voters back into their column. But again, it's not the Obama Trump voters are trying to get. It's the it's the Obama I didn't vote voters. So that's why he gets that wrong. The president's abject incompetence is doing all the work for them. Biden, meanwhile, is an ideal avatar for those voters, even if they become disillusioned with the leftward direction of the Democratic Party. Don't forget, Crash is a conservative. Yeah. Biden's now legendary selfie with a New York Times security guard and camaraderie with the Amtrak conductors were important vignettes highlighting his working class appeal. And that's true. Scranton Joe is going to be on tonight and he is who he is. And it's not fake. It's genuine. So, you know, it's it's why didn't you show that on nights one or two? Because the same reason you didn't show night three on night one. They're different nights doing different things in a big party trying to do a big tent thing. Oh, OK. On the other hand, <laughs> well, I knew that. But... It's also reasonable to expect that the demographic realignment that Trump fueled in 2016 may be unexpectedly resilient. It's reasonable to anticipate mm -hmm. Biden winning the presidency, but failing to bring in an outright Democratic Senate majority if Rural states like Iowa and Montana end up reelecting the Republican senators. It's likely the sudden spike in violent crime because crash hour is fixed on mm -hmm. violent crime. Every time it's there's like spiking. A, a pussycat is up in a tree and somebody call the cops, he tweets it out. Look what's happening. You know, he wow. yeah, for, you know, conservatives are just like obsessed with this for some reason. Well, the Republicans I think it's because they think the black hole. people are coming to get them. But I'm not going to say that out loud. Uh, it's oh, likely God. that the sudden spike it's in violence. And that's not Josh. I'm just saying in general, they just they're fixated on it. And it turns out <laughs> that uh, the, the crime thing doesn't really work for them the way it does, because uh, the Republican Party as a whole is only leading on crime uh, by a slight amount. You know, but it's the Willie Horton thing. It's likely that the sudden spike in violent crime in major cities could end up hampering some Democratic candidates in GOP-leaning districts where law and order message resonates, like Max Rose's seat in Staten Island, for instance. So let's watch Max Rose's seat in Staten Island and see what happens, because okay. I, I think he'll do just fine. But broadly speaking, the convention has served as a reminder that antipathy toward Trump is the glue holding the Democratic Party together. And his much maligned handling of the pandemic is likely the straw that finally breaks his presidency. And that's true. Yeah, I don't find too much fault with that. But it's creating, creating great confusion on what Biden will actually do in office if he gets there. Oh. OK, fine. Well, that's true for everybody. Once the president wins, everybody's your friend and then tries to get his ear. So I'm OK with that. And I, that's an argument I'm happy to have after November, after mm -hmm. he wins. Predicting the future is tough. Yeah, you know. 
Uh, couple that with article number two, which is uh, how Clinton's loss paved the way for Biden. And this is a theme from Seth Maskett, uh, 538, that we've talked about on the show before. If you can't figure out what happened in 2016, you're going to get 2020 wrong. Okay, I mean... Right, because you're going to try to correct what went wrong in 2016, but if you get that wrong, you're going to make the wrong corrections. Uh, And we were talking about that there in the primary. Maybe that doesn't fit in that headline, but okay. Surveys among Democratic voters and activists repeatedly showed that even when they didn't see Biden as their top candidate, they saw him as the most electable. And then he goes on in the article to talk about the fact that many of the professional Democrats, the people who run campaigns and such, have glommed on to the idea that there was too much identity politics in 2016, okay. which is, I think, a backdoor way of saying, yeah, it really was about misogyny. But, you know, we can't just say that outright. So let's just say identity politics, because that's such a big term. It probably includes everything. Uh, OK, sure. I mean, that's right. That's and overall, they prioritize big. electability to a far greater degree this year than they have in recent elections. And Biden was also, in some ways, a relatively easy choice for party insiders because he was broadly popular. He's basically generic Democrat. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, Biden represented a safe choice for the party that had tried something new in 2016 and in the eyes of many had been punished wow. for it. That's Seth Maskett's view. Or as I said, you know, old parts <laughs> don't like change. It doesn't yeah. matter whether you're a pundit or a party person. Uh, OK, that all right. That view has been expressed. Yeah, that view has been expressed. But, you know, is is it true? It it may be true with the party, uh, uh, you know, professionals who who get paid to do this, that the electorate is something else altogether. Yes. Right. Uh, And when we get back, we're going to go over this morning consult piece, which is basically polling on how uh, voters view the major party's competence. Competence? Yeah, Republicans versus Democrats generically. This is generic Republican, generic Democrat who does better on big issues, who does better on keeping the country safe, you know, that kind of thing. All right. Well, I imagine that would be, well, I hope, slaughter for uh, the Republicans, at least their chief anyway. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue on with the uh, the stroll through the news and the roundup from the convention and uh, the and the the deep deep punditry. We're, we're about halfway through the deep deep punditry, right, Greg? Yeah, deep through. Okay. Yep. Sure. All right. Well, let's see. Yes. Uh, now that we know how Clinton's loss paved the way for Biden, besides. The fact that uh, Biden wouldn't be the nominee if Clinton were right. The Losing paves the way because but, uh, if yes. you win, then there's no thing to pay. But you know, the, the bigger, broader picture. I was saying to David in the in the little break there is that look at the, to make sense of that. Look at the opposite. Okay, when you win, you're a genius and everything you did is right. You know, cool. that's why Carl Rove still has a spot on TV. Uh, uh, but Trump figures and Jared you know, who is the not so smart person who runs his campaign figures it worked in 2016. So therefore, we did everything right. So let's just do the same thing in 2020 as if nothing has changed. No pandemic. Hillary still our opponent. We'll still run against her. And of course, it'll work because why wouldn't it work? And if that doesn't work, then, you know, caravans. I guess so. Right. Yeah. All the, do the do the old hits, do the old hits, you know, uh, and and uh, we whereas the if you don't win, then uh, you're going to do a little soul searching and figure, OK, well, how can we do this in a different way? And, uh, you know, it's it's going to be really disappointing to a lot of people who want change faster. But uh, the Democrats certainly went with a little bit safer this time. And they didn't go with radical change, which is why 
when the Republicans run against the Democrats as radicals, it falls flat. And that was part of the plan. Hmm. I don't know if you've taken a look at the Washington Post front page today. No. Uh, but if you go to the digital front page no. without having to click through to any articles, you see the big banner headline, of course, Harris accepts historic VP nomination. We will speak truths. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that she identified uh, Trump as a predator is just perfect. Yeah. And then Bill Riley chimes in and says, well, obviously, I don't care. They say they care about everybody, but they don't care about me. Well, that's because you're a predator, too. Yeah, well, <laughs> they care about you. I mean, in the they care about you. Sense. It's just not the way you want. Yeah. Uh, but the point is, if you look at the headline of The Washington Post, I above it that. are a bunch of ads paid for by Trump. I see it really, now. Or editorial decision by The Washington Post, by the way. But what the, ad, the ad says, the radical leftist takeover of Joe Biden is complete. Too radical Hooray. for us. That's their oh. campaign thing. I mean, and it's blaring oh, no. all over the front page of The Washington Post, uh, you know, these ads in, uh, in yeah. the digital form, which I think is Three awful. Places, but. But you get you get their theme. What and what a theme, right? And what a theme it is. The radical leftist takeover, and we just went through the whole idea that Biden was the safest thing to do, and they're trying to push this radical stuff. Yes. And so you know, I'm just saying, I don't think it's going to work. But there's always going to be a segment of the population it does work with. So this uh, morning consult poll: How voters view the major parties' com- competence has hardly changed since 2016, nearly four years. After Trump's election, voters remain slightly more likely to deem Democrats capable of governing and tackling big issues. And it may be frustrating to you as a Democrat why the gap isn't bigger. But uh, as they famously say in 2020, it is what it is. Forty eight percent of voters say the Democratic Party is capable of governing. Forty four percent says is adept at handling the country's major issues compared to 42 and 38. So they got a you know five or six point lead over the GOP, which is, you know, a, a lot where they lead in the swing states. Hmm. Now, by double digit margins, voters are more likely to say the parties have moved to the ideological extreme. So in other words, uh, the voters think that the Democrats have a liberal party, even if liberals in the Democrats don't think the Democrats have a liberal party. Ah. And the conservative, uh, the voters think that the Republicans have a conservative party and Republicans think they have a conservative party. And they're right, you know, right in front of you is the difference between Democrats and Republicans. Hmm. Yes. Oh, we don't think we're liberal. Enough. Well, we think we're totally conservative. Well, see, okay. both sides. Well, no, exactly. It's hmm. not both sides. Creaky cheer today. All right. Yes, but, I was distracted. But in a repeat from 2018, mm-hmm. Democrats are more likely than Republicans to say they're worried and angry about the upcoming elections. This isn't the only poll that picked that up. Other polls have said if you're looking at who's angry and angry makes you go vote, it's Democrats. Yeah. Uh, and it's an interesting thing. They're not coming back the same way they usually do. This, this, it wavers back and forth. But when Democrats in the past, in more normal elections, have described themselves as angry, that's been a talking point against them. The angry, angry left, radical as well. You know, they've been saying we're the most radical ticket since forever. But yeah, uh, but uh, but. But the I will say Ever since FDR, uh, the press uh, like reveled in. Uh, identifying the conservatives as the angry voters last time, and that it was this fantastic thing somehow the the, the anger being uh, displayed by Trump voters that they were uh, like fueled by r- righteous anxiety. indignation is how it was viewed, as yeah. opposed to you know hissy fits, which is how you know left leaning anger is viewed. Uh, really, pretty remarkable from our so called liberal media, but uh, not new. You already well, you know, again, the poll, the poll findings can tackle the big issues facing the country. Democrats, 44, Republicans, 38. So Democrats have the lead on that in terms so of the confidence part. We'll keep the country safe. This is surprising. Mm-hmm. Uh, Democrats, 44 and Republicans, 42. In the George H.W. Bush era, it was a huge advantage for Republicans. That's gone. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it has well. been since 2016. So that's pretty interesting. That really hasn't changed. Is capable of governing the democrats had a four-point lead in 2016 and a six-point lead in 2020 so that hasn't changed what has changed is uh cares about middle class americans uh the democrats continue their lead cares about people like me the democrats continue their lead cares about wealthy americans republicans 78 
Democrats 38, the, the parties that is. Yes. Voters think that the Republican Party cares about wealthy Americans and the Democrats not so much. Uh, yeah, well, I care about them. They care about people just... like you, but they don't care about wealthy right, Americans. Right. Oh, well, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Tax them. We care about them in that Tax sense, the rich. certainly. And uh, we don't want to necessarily put every one of them in a blender, but... You know, right. but yeah, that, but that's an interesting way of putting it. They, how they voters in case swing else. groups evaluate the parties? How? Voters were asked whether the Democratic Party or the GOP cares more about people like you, all voters, Democratic Party 43, Republican Party 32. It's a pretty mm-hmm. big gap there. And suburban yes. voters, 44, 31. And with the undecided, uh, 18 to 14. So Democrats clearly care more. They're more empathic, empathetic. There's no question about it. Right. Is more capable of governing. It's much more of a tie. All voters, Democrats, 41 Republican uh, Republican Party is given 36. These aren't Democrats saying it's what do all voters look at the parties like? So Democratic Party, 41 and Republican Party, 36. So there's a a slight lead for capable of governing as schools start to uh, open and then close and sports doesn't happen. I would guess that gap is going to widen a little bit. But don't expect it to widen tremendously. And with suburban voters, 42, 36 in favor of Democrats. And with undecided, it's actually Republicans, Democrats, 11, Republicans, 19. So undecided undecided. voters still think Republicans are more capable of governing. I see. Okay. (laughs) Well, maybe that's why they're having difficulty deciding. That's why they're having difficulty deciding. I don't know anything. You know, if, if, if I already decided... And that doesn't mean it's got a large group. But if I already decided that you screwed up, you're not talking about me. Yes. You're, you're talking about people who, you know, which party's which? What's going on? Hmm. You know, is more capable of tackling the big issues facing the country, all voters, Democrat Party, Democratic Party, 40 percent, and Republican Party, 36 percent. Again, closer than you would think in the suburbs, 41, 36. So Democrats have an edge. It's usually a five or six point edge. It's not a 14 point edge, but they do have double digit advantages when it comes to caring about people like you. Hmm. And in a case where, uh, as is the today, uh, you know, again, the uh, unemployment numbers are over a million for uh, applying for unemployment that yes. may or may not exist at this point based on what the Republicans are doing. Caring about people like you really matters. So, uh, you know, that's the background for all of this. I love people like and, that. you know, the, the, Dem- the Republicans remain confident because they remain confident in their base. The Democrats are never confident because they're Democrats, but they feel like they're making a play not only for their base, but for independents and for people who didn't vote in 2016 because they figured there was no difference between the parties. Well, there's a big difference in terms of caring about people like you. And now is the time where it's important to care about people like you because things are not good. So uh, we'll see how that plays out over time. And that leads us to Ron Brownstein's article. The Democratic Convention is a reality check for Trump. Blue America is only growing. Despite a pandemic that's killed more than 170,000 Americans and cratered the economy. Mm, Yes. The latest surveys show Trump maintaining strong support among white voters most uneasy about demographic and cultural changes remaking America. Again, the narrator. That's why they picked Biden. Mm. Particularly those who are evangelical Christians live in rural areas or lack a college degree. And despite a Democratic nominee who stirs only modest enthusiasm among many key Uh party constituencies... Those same polls show Biden amassing big advantages among the groups most comfortable with those changes. Young people, racial minorities, secular Americans, and college-educated white Americans. The division of the electorate leads Biden holding a steady and substantial lead in national polling over Trump that matches or slightly exceeds a Democrat's 8 percentage point edge in the total national vote for the House of Representatives in 2018. But the uneven distribution of these contrasting constituencies across the battleground states means Democrats will likely remain nervous through Election Day about their ability to win the Electoral College, even if Biden maintains a healthy lead in the popular vote, which, by the way, it shouldn't. If your lead is more than four or five points, that's going to be enough. If it's less than that, you better worry about the Electoral College. Okay. 
Well, so last night's proceedings, Ron Brownstein says, yes. were effectively a tribute to America's growing diversity. Yes, but also. Tuesday wasn't and Monday wasn't. True, but it was a diversity of message. Ah. Yes, exactly. And then if you have a diversity of message, it's, well, they don't have a single theme. That's right. Well, and that's because it's, they have diversity. Yeah. Okay. I mean, have I get that. Why doesn't he get that? Mm. Does he later in the article? He does. Well, you know, he, he's not the one having knew. an issue with this. It's some of the conservative ah, commentators okay. who I didn't see. like what they were seeing. Right. But did specifically say, well, this didn't work for me. That was terrible. This is awful. Oh, my gosh. I After like seeing Calamari. Kamala Harris, all of a sudden, said Eric Erickson, I actually realistically see uh, Donald Trump being reelected for the first time. <laughs> okay. He said that. Uh, well, yeah. What is it about Kamala Harris that made you think that? Hmm. Hmm. Calamari. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. What do we think it might be? It is uh, odd, isn't uh, it? It could be misogyny. It could be racism. Hard to tell. You know, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and Misogyno say, why not both? Are. Yes. Right. Uh, the right. brilliantly reimagined convention roll call reinforced the point with brief testimonials, some somber, others goofy, from another diverse roster of speakers in every state and territory, a change that drew rave reviews on Twitter and TV news. Some Democratic activists complained that organizers had allocated too much of the event's limited time to Republicans and too little to non-white progressive leaders such as Stacey Abrams and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but average viewers probably absorbed a very different image. On a day when Trump delivered an incendiary speech in Yuma, Arizona, touting his border wall and reprising the language from 2015 about immigrants as murderers and rapists, Democrats offered the 21st century version of a Norman Rockwell painting. Hmm. Yes. Right? And that contrast testifies nice. to the depth and the intractability of the modern American divide. Even as Democrats gather to nominate Scranton and Joe, whose supporters have long touted his ability to recapture working-class white voters, many indications suggest 2020 could cleave the electric more deeply than ever before with a diverse, more and more educated, culturally cosmopolitan, metropolitan-based coalition of transformation. That's Ron Brownstein's thing. On the Democratic side, and a preponderantly white, heavily blue-collar, Christian, non-urban coalition of restoration on the Republican side. He's used those terms for years. The stark reality of that separation would test the bridge building capacity of any president. And that's true. So that's where we stand. And it's really a question of who you're trying to appeal to. And that's why it's so important to get the 2016 people off the sidelines. Hmm. You can't convince Trump voters, you know, really solid Trump voters to not vote for Trump. It's not going to happen. I think it's because they're too racist. But whatever the reason, it's not going to happen. So what you have to do is you have to mobilize those independents. Again, a different constituency than 2016, because when you look at independent, that's always a changing electorate. The independence of 2020 won't be the independence of 2016. And you've got to get them off the sidelines. And that's why, again, going back to what I originally said, I think both the campaign and the entire Democratic convention were uh, aimed at mobilizing those people who didn't vote in 2016, whereas the Republican convention is more likely going to be trying to energize the base they already have, but not go after new people. Okay. Well, uh, I have a new uh, basis on which they might try and convince people who voted for Donald Trump last time to, to break away from him. Uh, the breaking news, uh, it's happening, QAnon friends. The indictments are coming down, except... They're coming down against Steve Bannon, who apparently has had his indictment by the Southern District of New York announced uh, just in the last few minutes. Uh, oh, apparently and what, did, what is he being indicted, indicted for? Indicted uh, in a fraud scheme, uh, n not his role necessarily directly in the, uh, in, the, in the Trump campaign or its collusion with Russia, but instead indicted over his one of his outside but Trump adjacent projects, the We Build the Wall Fund, a sort of a, a GoFundMe type crowdfunding effort that raised money to privately construct a section of U.S. Mexico border wall, except it wasn't on the U.S. Mexico border or connected to any other wall. Yes, uh, yes. So, uh, Trump can't get the money from yeah. the federal government, so we'll just raise the money privately. Yes. Uh, and as small it turns donations, out, give they to me. stole it. Or, or at least that's the accusation. So fraud involved in that effort, 
uh, to no one's surprise, really. But that has led to a, a fraud indictment for Steve Bannon, who you know had just been trying to strong arm his way back into the news recently, too. So now he's there firmly. And uh, we'll find out. Well, now I know plays. why he didn't look well. Yes, right. Well, because he's Steve Bannon, and he's uh, he's a hard liver. Uh, I, I, that is to say, I believe his his liver may be harder than it's supposed to be. Uh, or as Robert George from the New York Daily mm-hmm. News says, "Never a dull moment." Yeah, right. Pretty much. So that throws some fun into the morning. Everyone's going to enjoy that one. So our friend Armando notes, if they indicted Bannon, they must have extremely strong evidence against him. And that would especially be true if it went through uh, the uh, Bill Barr uh, Justice Department and it happened mm. this close to an election. Yeah, that's true. Somebody must have had something to say about that. I, I suppose they could have kept it more or less under the radar. Or it's entirely possible that, you know, Trump, you know, I don't care about that guy anymore. Go ahead. Now, remember, just a few days ago, we learned that Trump's original campaign manager, Paul Manafort. Yes. Uh, was colluding with the Russians. Yes, he was. We learned that, and that his four partner years ago. is a longtime Russian uh, spy. Yes, I feel like we learned that four years ago too. But now everyone but, says it. But then, so when that didn't work out, they replaced Paul Manafort with Steve Bannon, hmm. who was just indicted for fraud. Yes. Uh, let's see. It was Corey Lewandowski was in the mix before him. I don't think he's been indicted yeah. on anything lately. All that stuff. So, you know, it's pretty amazing, actually, when you go back and think about it. Yeah. Uh, so as, as my con- as conservative Republican friend, Evan Siegfried, tweets, uh, Steve Bannon indicted. Trump is finally draining the swamp. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's that's big news, but it only reinforces what we're talking about here and reinforces Joe Biden's potential appeal, at least. Now, um, the thing about Steve Bannon's indictment is that, and and for all I know, Trump will pardon him tomorrow. I don't know. But the thing is that everybody in Trump world knows who he is. Yeah. Everybody in Breitbart world knows who he is. Everybody in MAGA world knows who he is. Uh, So that's going to certainly have reverberations of some sort. Uh, So, yeah, really interesting news. Yeah, well, uh, it, uh, it, it could have happened to a nicer guy if they really tried, but it was fun to watch them do this one. Uh, yeah, we'll see where this one goes. I, I imagine Trump world could just as easily absorb this, though, as, uh, well, of course, the deep state is coming for him. Uh-huh. Okay, whatever. Yeah, well, Bill Barr's Justice Department just indicted him, so yeah, you know, that, is that what you mean by deep state? Is that what you mean so. by swamp? Uh yeah, maybe I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you maybe I don't make know. Make it up as you go along. What the hell? QAnon right. has a lot of flexibility to it. Uh, so that uh, you know, yet another big story because it's a big story every day. Sure. Uh, but hey, if he wanted to distract hey. from the Democratic National Convention, you know, what better way than indicting Steve Bannon? <laughs> yeah, it is a good. Point. Probably Jared's idea. Yeah, I know. I see. Yeah, I, I I wonder whether uh, <clears throat> like Steve Bannon uh, just sent them, you know, like an overdue uh, notice for for billing for the 2016 campaign or something, and they said, uh, "Don't pay that, arrest them." You know, f this, go arrest them. Right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, the post office. So uh, as you predicted, and as uh, many predicted, despite the uh, superficial win. Um, uh, Nancy Pelosi said yesterday that she spoke with uh, DeJoy, the postmaster general, who refused to put the sorting machines back. Uh, uh, yes, it's in, it's we're interesting. Still taking them out. Um, the Upshot had this really interesting piece here. And, you know, part of the weird conservative reaction to you're all making this up, I think, you know, stems from a, a much more simple, you know, look at things. When you talk about the post office, are you talking to the managers mm-hmm. or are you talking to the workers? Uh, me? Because you get a different picture. Yeah, true. Right? If you talk to the managers, well, the post office is inefficient and, and we can handle this. Can the post office handle election mail while the recession could actually help? Because of the recession, there isn't as much marketing mail. So capacity is much greater than it normally is. And the post office ought to be able to handle this. And they have the ability to do uh, all of this uh, holiday mail, although they do that by hiring people and going on overtime. Uh, But uh, they can do this. 
And that may, in fact, on paper be true. But it presupposes a level of uh, trust and goodwill and good faith in trying to get this done that, of course, doesn't exist because you have uh, Gordon uh, Sondland running the post office. Or Gordon Sondland equivalent. Yes. You have uh, the Joy running the post office who is a uh, Trump lackey who is totally interested in privatizing the place and totally interested in Trump's program of uh, delaying and confusing things. And so with a lack of good faith, it may be that the post office could have handled all of this, especially with uh, marketing mail plummeting 36 percent, allowing that capacity but won't be allowed to do this because they won't be given over time because those sorters will be dismantled and for no reason. And it's got nothing to do with efficiency because if you take away the capacity to be able to handle the mail, then the mail doesn't get handled. And nobody has explained how getting rid of sorting machines is good for efficiency. Uh, no, uh, they haven't. And uh, yeah, some some interesting news yesterday. Uh, not only uh, some skepticism about DeJoy's promises being expressed even by Nancy Pelosi, but apparently right in the middle of the whole thing, uh, after having promised to halt all of these removals, uh, reports began coming in from around the country of, no, I'm a reporter for a local television station and I'm watching removals happening now. Right. So he lied. Yeah. And uh, the that hearing, uh, the first one's going to be on What's Friday. Yeah. And the second one's going to be on Monday, and there's going to be a vote in between on Saturday. So obviously it's not over. But then again, the Democrats aren't letting up on that either. And when you don't get your mail, you feel it just like it's stupid to have some management type explain to a guy who just lost his job why this isn't really a recession. Yes. Put up all the damn charts you want. If I just lost my job, I know what this is. If you're out there and you're not getting your medicines in the mail, I know what this is. Right. And, you know, yeah, so right. yeah, it's, it's going to be a really interesting approach watching them try to dance around that. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, there's okay. QAnon. And there's, uh, <laughs> you know, know Trump guys. endorsing QAnon. And by the way, QAnon just been kicked off a whole bunch of Facebook uh, uh, secret uh, yes. groups. And by the way, mm -hmm. there's also Good. Trump saying that, you know, if I lose the election, well, I'll think about whether or not I leave. And Kaylee McEnany, uh, you know, yes. confirming that oh, yeah. it's up to him and he'll decide later. He's the decider. You know, silly stuff, but real stuff. And that's part of why Obama was saying, I don't understand why you don't see this. Yeah. Right. And so the last point that I would make is another uh, theme that the conservatives have come up with, mm -hmm. which is actually interesting in its own right, is that the trouble with Obama Oh, let's get is that, that he keeps thinking that <laughs> this is all Sorry. evident yes. and half the country doesn't, hmm. right? Which was part of Josh uh, uh, our article yeah. uh, from the National Journal that, you know, he's just, he's angry, uh, he's furious, he sees what he sees, it's crystal clear to him, it's crystal clear to Democrats, but it's only crystal clear to half the country. And the other half of the country doesn't think it's so crystal clear and isn't all, yeah. you know, worked up about Boy. the fact that Trump's trying to steal the election. Uh, so it makes it yeah, very right. difficult to uh, convey outrage when everybody isn't outraged. The post office is another story. People are outraged about that. Yes. So that one will work well. So yeah. if but you're going to talk so, about 52%. stealing, you know, what's wrong with the post office? It happens uh, that they're know. trying to steal the election using the post office. But what I'm telling you is they're screwing up your mail. Get mad about that. That works simple enough. And right. The, the moment anybody notices something very late or missing, they'll say, aha, I've been hearing about this. Yeah. Which exactly. you can thank uh, your congressional Democrats for doing last weekend. Anyway, that's my sequence uh, and, and uh, segment and, and observations for today. Again, thanks to uh, Denise Velas for uh, being on yesterday. Yes. And uh, giving us uh, some clues as to what to watch for. Right. And tonight, I think, will be another good visual. And, of course, all eyes will be on Scranton Joe. Uh, and uh, we'll see how that goes. And then uh, you'll talk about it tomorrow, and I'll be back on Monday, and we shall do it again. It'll all happen all over again. It does feel like Groundhog a day. day. Yeah, sometimes. All right. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have Bill Murray on to talk ah. about what happened. 
Yes, uh, sure. Why not? He'd probably do it too uh, if we actually knew about the show and we gave him the uh, the Skype number. He's that kind of guy. Yeah, you never so. know. All right, Alrighty, take Very care, good. and I Thank will you. talk to you on Monday. Okay, that sounds like a good plan. Have a good weekend. We'll be chatting in the meantime, I'm sure. Uh, more news from out of the courts, by the way. Uh, a judge has just thrown out Trump's challenge to the Manhattan DA's subpoena for his tax records. So his first line challenge to that. I mean, he'll then appeal that and appeal that and appeal that. Well, he's going to lose that. It won't be till yeah. after the election, but Cy Vance is getting those uh, tax returns. Yeah, right. So uh, I just keep that in mind, by the way. How long does it take to get tax records out of a president reluctant to turn them over? Uh, with enough fraud, four years. Mm. So, you know, if you're only aiming at four years, uh, you might get away with it. Right. So depressing times, but help is on the way. Take sure. care and okay. I'll talk to you on Monday. Very good. All right. See you then. And uh, it does say it does feel like depressing times. This this particular page I'm looking at on CNBC, somehow illustrated by a uh, sad looking dog. I don't really know. They don't have the story up yet. They don't have the the uh, the insider story of it. Just the fact that the judge throws out challenge to Manhattan DA's subpoena. So, okay, once uh, we can add that eventually to the uh, you're really good at getting stuff done or whatever dotard thread, although it's just not that exciting a bit of news. Uh, expected, an expected loss, but uh, good that they turned it around pretty quickly because I think Trump was just basically depending on, and he'll, like we said, with, with uh, not enough days left before the uh, election, in effect, he wins. But, uh, yeah, we've been expecting for a long time that it would just be delay, 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 uh, baseless delays on that. And sure enough, very quickly, the judge agrees. Yeah, that was pretty baseless and stupid and I'm not going to let it occupy a great deal of my time. But, uh, yeah, you'll succeed in delaying things until the FBI election. Okay, that's sad. We'll see if we can't check up and get any new information about Steve Bannon in the one-minute break. But plenty of other directions to go into. Maybe we can just wait and let that story develop and discuss it uh, a little bit tomorrow. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Welcome back now to the Kid Going the Morning Show here on Networks Radio. Uh, let's see. I do have this piece of information, a good observation made uh, regarding the indictment against uh, Steve Bannon, who's making the call here. Staff writer at The Atlantic, Edward Isaac DeVere, who points out uh, the following. Uh, Chris Kobach, whom we know and hate from Kansas, uh, the uh, conspiracy theorist who's dedicated his life to proving the massive voter fraud that Donald Trump uh, hopes to make central to his claims to hold on to power after a massive loss at the polls in November. Chris Kobach is the general counsel of the Build the Wall PAC that Steve Bannon was just uh, well, it says arrested, but uh, it, we know indicted. I don't know whether they actually went and arrested him or not. That'd be even more exciting. Uh, indicted, anyway, for being involved in as chairman. So it's going to pull a lot of people in with him. Uh, that's the important point. Uh, there was a, an effective grift going on, and so all the big names were going to make their way over there and try to get a bite at the apple, and now they'll all, I guess, be called to account in some form or another, and we'll see uh, whether maybe somebody will uh, turn against the rest of them and, uh, in, in exchange for a deal, or maybe they'll all go down this way, or maybe none of them will because a lot of them are rich and white. But Chris Kobach, general counsel for the Build the Wall Pact that Steve Bannon just got indicted for chairing, the advisory board includes Eric Prince. Of course, you'll recognize that name as the CEO of the firm formerly known as Blackwater, uh, and who had all sorts of illicit dealings, according to the Mueller report and the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee, prior to the election and then in between, uh, meeting with Russian intelligence officials in the Seychelles, right? And, of course, uh, the brother of Education Secretary, nominally speaking, Betsy DeVos. So who else is on the advisory board besides Eric Prince? And, and why wouldn't he be on the build the wall pack thing? I, again, there was grift They he heard he could get a piece of. So he, he took a bite at it. Who else? Former 
Colorado Congressman Tom Tancredo. Remember that guy? He too on the board. Also Sheriff Dave Clark, former Sheriff Dave Clark. You remember that guy with the, 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 who was the sheriff who looked like he had a second job at TGI Fridays. You remember the vest covered in, uh, in, uh, pieces of flair, right? And also, uh, former Major League Baseball pitcher and now full time, uh, conspiracy theorist, a hole, Kurt Schilling. What a stellar board. And I guess that's one of the things about it is uh you find as a grifter you know the living is easy once you get to be famous people will just put you automatically on the boards of other grifts but if one of them goes down they start to pull you all in and the interlocking directorates of grift begin to fall apart so uh, i love it Uh, you hate to see it now you love to see it as people have now begun saying more regularly than uh trump saying you hate to see it and uh wow That'll be fun to follow up on that story. Not much in the way of details yet, although I guess we could, uh, well, we could do what uh, Edward here did and do some background research on the Build the Wall group, but uh, I'll leave that for others. We can look at their already completed research in the form of their articles that I have uh, stuffed into my pockets for later reading. Let's see. Um, What have we uh, to share with you. Oh, here's some, a little bit of coronavirus news. Oh yeah, look, The Hill, how we'll grab this uh, version of The Hill Bannon story. The Hill's headline reads, the much more exciting <clears throat> news that Bannon and three others, we should find out who they are, maybe they're the ones uh, just named, charged with defrauding donors of We Build the Wall campaign. But more exciting than that was the the tweet that accompanied it, and I noticed that the line that's in the tweet does not appear in the headline, so we'll have to read the story. The tweet reads, just in, Bannon arrested, comma, charged with fraud over We Build the Wall campaign. So now I really feel like we have to at least skim quickly through the Hill story and see whether they stand by that in the body of their article or whether that was just a mistake or clickbait. Uh, I'll... Skip through the boring intro here. Yeah, former White House. Well, no, that's that's the regular stuff. Okay, the boring stuff is that he's a former White House chief strategist, etc. Uh, he and three others arrested, so it says, and charged with defrauding hundreds of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of donors, probably out of those dollars, who contributed to a fundraising campaign for a private border wall. The U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York said Thursday, Bannon, Brian Colfage, uh, I don't think I know the guy, Andrew Badalato, uh, name sounds familiar, but it might just be, uh, that he sounds like a guy who might've gone to high school with me or something. And Timothy Shea, uh, I have to look these guys up, but I, I, I bet we have heard some of those names before. Anyway, they allegedly defrauded donors of the online crowdfunding campaign known as we build the wall. Oh, was Brian Colfage might have been the head of the nominally the head of that or the originator of that. And he's just a constant. We uh, go fund me type grifter. I think we've read about him in the past. Uh, oh, and Greg is providing some background research on this, too. All right. Let's check into it. Uh, they have allegedly defrauded donors of the online crowdfunding campaign known as We Build the Wall, which raised more than $25 million, the office said. The four defendants are expected to appear in court Thursday afternoon. I guess so. I mean, that's what you do with people once you arrest them, right? Uh, As alleged, the defendants defrauded hundreds of thousands of donors, capitalizing on their interest in funding a border wall to raise millions of dollars uh, under the false pretense that all of the money would be spent on construction. (laughs) I mean, if that wasn't an obvious lie right from the outset, I don't know what was. But it's the sort of thing that people want to believe. So good claim if you're a grifter. This according to acting U.S. Attorney, acting, what do you know, U.S. Attorney Audrey Strauss. Uh, Remember, of course, that the players in the Southern District of New York's U.S. Attorney's Office were shuffled around quite a bit, uh, giving some people some nominal promotions so that they would move out of the way. And uh, I thought the plan was not indict Trump associates, but I guess the new ones. And you'll you'll recall also that there was a battle over who would succeed the departing 
and even the departing person may have been acting U.S. attorney. I can't really recall off the top of my head, but the, you know, there was a big fight over who that would be, and it was considered to have been won by the departing U.S. attorney, uh, replacing them not with a Bill Barr lackey, but with somebody who they trusted to do the right thing more often than not. And I guess they've done it at least well in the Bannon context. All right, so let's see. There's not that much more. They're facing charges including one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud and one count of conspiracy to commit money laundering, a very popular Trump adjacent crime. Each charge carries a maximum prison sentence of 20 years. So I think that they should get that. And uh also by the way, Steve Bannon, uh you should wear a maximum number of shirts of 20 as well. Just uh, that's just prison etiquette, I think. So I don't want you to get yourself in trouble uh, when you report to the big house. We'll see. I'll have to count down to when that's going to happen. Uh, Let's see. Mm, Let me flip over to what Greg had sent in Skype. It uh, promised to be uh, somewhat interesting in terms of, I guess he must have raked up a few extra points. Yeah, here we go. Uh, The tweet uh, from... Another source here, uh, Brandy Zadrozny, reporter for NBC News, uh, Colfage, Bannon, Battelotto, and Shea. Uh, okay, the same names. They received all this money, and I don't know. I guess it doesn't say what they did with it, but uh, just confirming the story we got from The Hill on that one. And uh, let's see, what else? Was there more? Any other developments? That uh, Okay, he's just uh, quoting from her tweet here. How did Colfage allegedly spend those build the wall funds on a boat? That is to say he bought the boat, not that he boarded a boat and then spent the money thereafter, say, uh, by ordering other things on the internet. On a boat and plastic surgery, according to the feds. That will be interesting. I would love to find out uh, who, or or rather, just for curiosity's sake exactly what was that plastic surgery i want to know what was so valuable to him Uh, more people breaking all the details here this is terrific wait a minute i scrolled past it too fast uh somebody had some details on what colfage was up to let's see no no that wasn't it dang uh that went too far too fast okay oh there we are natasha bertrand i was just going to try searching around colfage covertly, not covertly enough, though, took for his personal use more than $350,000 in these funds that donors had given to We Build the Wall, while Bannon received over a million from We Build the Wall, at least some of which Bannon used to cover hundreds of thousands of dollars in personal expenses. Well, once you've stolen it, I I figured that's what you're going to do with it. Uh, I don't know where that information is coming from, but I guess it's coming out of the indictments. People thumbing through them now. Uh, and, uh, all right. Well, very interesting. <clears throat> we'll keep an eye on that one. We'll probably have some more information and maybe it'll even be juicy, salacious stuff by tomorrow, I guess. Uh, oh, look at this. Uh, Armando, though, with this additional observation, the company that built the wall for build the wall, uh, was Fisher Industries and they received one, a $1.3 billion contract from the federal government, I guess, to do other parts of the wall. So hmm, that's interesting and worth watching as well. All right, I'll uh, put that aside and mark it up for inclusion in today's roundup. And now we can, I think we'll keep one eye on the Twitter scroll and see if anything else uh, you need to keep up. Oh, well, good observation from our, oops, uh, I can only hold things on the screen for so long, but uh, from our good friend Jesse LaGreca, a good observation. How effing dumb did you have to be to vote for the Mexico will pay to build the wall guy and then send your own money to build the wall? You just had to be very excited and pro-wall is the real answer, but uh, the funnier answer is uh, is that one. Uh, a lot of effing dumb. That's how dumb it would have to be. All right. Uh, maybe if I if I keep my eye on the Twitter scroll, I might not get to anything else at this point. But uh, that was just fun and exciting. I, I love to see the downfall of Steve Bannon. 
uh, if we can finally get around to it, will be fun and exciting. Uh, okay, let's see. Oh, here's a interesting. I guess I have uh, put away here a, a tweet from Brian Colfadge himself. We Build the Wall has officially deleted the largest GoFundMe campaign ever from the GoFundMe platform. We will not give them another penny after raising $27 million. We're taking our business to Fundraiser. I didn't even know there was a... I mean, I figured there must be an alternative somewhere. Uh, where censorship doesn't happen. Something, something. I guess they believe that they were somehow unfairly treated by GoFundMe, which is pretty amazing. Uh, pretty soon, of course, they'll turn their attention to claiming they've been unfairly treated by the Southern District of New York's U.S. Attorney's Office. Okay. Uh, wonder what he's uh, specifically complaining about. There's a, uh, <clears throat> a link to a dumb news source here. GoFundMe censors Colfage campaign. Ah, his latest GoFundMe uh, scam. Uh, a campaign to help riot victims sue black lives matter uh how they're going to do that and who they'll name in the suit i have no idea but uh you know you get the picture i don't think i have to tell you too much more about that to uh, understand what that's all about all right mark that one for inclusion too because it's ridiculous and then you know you might not believe it unless you get to see it for yourself okay um other things to discuss uh, i mentioned that there was some <clears throat> some coronavirus news um just to kind of keep you up to date on something you've probably been waiting to hear more about. I happen to see The Hill tweeting about this one because they tweet about everything about every eight minutes. Uh, officials warn Sturgis bar patron. You'll never guess what, what might have happened. He may have transmitted coronavirus to others. Yeah. All right. Thanks to Justine Coleman for writing this up for The Hill. South Dakota health officials warned that a bar patron may have transmitted coronavirus to other customers during the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally, which I'm okay with, honestly. We just have to keep the rest of them in isolation now. That won't happen, and we'll really find ourselves in trouble shortly, but okay. South Dakota health officials warned about this. Uh, South Dakota Health Department said in a notice published Tuesday that a customer at the One-Eyed Jack's Saloon in Sturgis, South Dakota, on August 11th has tested positive for coronavirus. Health officials instructed people at the bar between noon and 5.30 p.m. to get a life, but also that they need to monitor for symptoms for 14 days after the possible transmission date. The infected customer's visit fell during the 10-day motorcycle rally that attracted more than 460,000 vehicles, or like I say, as, as the cops in those parts sometimes say, vehicles, the, uh, that according to the Associated Press, Estimated crowd size was almost 8% less than last year. Some of those bikers are getting pretty elderly. Uh, they may have stayed home. Most people at the rally did not take coronavirus precautions like wearing masks and social distancing, the AP noted. Some public health experts said they're concerned that the rally could become a super spreader event. Uh, that seems pretty obvious. I don't think we need, through the, need to read through the rest of the article. Just wanted to let you know that uh, we've got our first warning anyway to the Sturgis attendees that, uh, yep, you've been exposed. Now we'll see how they deal with it. Uh, my bet is poorly, but you never know. They may surprise us. Uh, other quick coronavirus news hits. Uh, I don't know if we really hit any specific milestones yesterday, although we're up above 175,000 uh, deaths in the United States. Uh, news from the Miami-Dade County area down in Florida, where, you know, everyone's on fire with COVID-19. Nearly 600 Miami-Dade County Public Schools employees have tested positive for COVID-19. Now, I, I don't know what the status of their schools is in terms of whether they're open or not. And this is actually a roundup of how many of their employees have tested positive uh, throughout the pandemic. So from March through July, many of them doubtless will have recovered by now, but just basically, I guess this must mean that they're not open yet, or at least that if they are open, they haven't yet uh, had to shut a large number of schools back down again because of the coronavirus, but potentially that's what they're facing. And this might just be a good early warning 
to the uh, school board folks down there. All right, well, we got to check in on how are those people doing, how many of them are still active with the virus, and uh, does that endanger our plans to reopen the schools? Um, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, another big story uh, that I did happen to see this morning and uh, really didn't get, uh, I didn't think we were going to get around to doing this, but uh, Greg has sent us a reminder Good idea to bring us up to date on it. Uh, NBC News tweet noting that Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny is in a coma as doctors fight for his life after he was, you'll never guess, poisoned Thursday morning, his spokesperson says. So, uh, yeah, terrible news there. Navalny has been really an interesting source for some interesting information about uh, happenings in Russia that affect happenings here in the United States because of President Trump's plan for overt political union between Russia and the United States. He's, of course, as Greg notes, their most prominent opposition leader. We've uh, read his work here on the show. I mean, his opposition is not just in the form of a waging political campaign to win the presidency of Russia, but also uh, research and publication of uh, what he uh, tells us is uh, his, his revealing insight into the criminal syndicate that runs Russia, that we've suspected was there all along. And uh, I'm sure there's plenty of motivations behind it, but of course, just as many motivations for the mobsters that he's exposing to poison and kill him. And I guess they've very nearly got the job done. So, uh, you know, want to note that one and, and hope that he pulls through. He's been uh, pretty incredible in providing uh, insight into what's happening there in ways that are very important to our unraveling what's happening here. So, uh, what do we say? Thoughts and prayers. I mean, the hackneyed thing. It's a, not a shooting. It's a poisoning. That's the way they do it there. I'm surprised it didn't go through a window, quite honestly. Uh, let's see. Mm, yes, okay. We got that information about uh, the people involved in GoFundMe's uh, Build the Wall. Oh, Ballerina X says that the website is still up at webuildthewall.us. And that uh, the team members are all still listed there. So, okay. I imagine that uh, they uh, aren't aren't able to take the website down because they're under arrest. Here's an even more interesting detail about the arrest. Uh, let's see. Who's tweeted this one around? Uh, Brandon Friedman brings it to my attention. with a, uh, you'll, you'll laugh, too, when you find out that Margaret Brennan is reporting for, uh, all right, let's scroll over and find out, Face the Nation moderator and CBS News foreign affairs correspondent Margaret Brennan reporting that CBS News's Pat Milton finds that Steve Bannon was taken into custody. Remember what the crime here is. It's wire fraud, right, and uh, money laundering, GoFundMe, everybody sending checks, I guess, to these guys. So guess what happens? Taken into custody today by who? Who made the arrest? The, the Southern District of New York handed down the indictment. Who made the arrest? New York City cops? No. The U.S. Postal Service agents have made the arrest because mail fraud, wire fraud. He's expected to be arraigned today before a U.S. magistrate. The uh, Let's see. And then, of course, what the allegation was all about. But yeah, how would you like that? To be arrested, taken into custody by postal service agents. That's pretty perfect. So uh, well done there. Don't defund the post office. Okay, uh, let's see. What other things do we want to touch on at this point? All right, time probably to move on to some of the other stories I've been discussing and, and tucked away for consideration. I mentioned, speaking of the post office, uh, when we were talking to Greg, the reports from around the country that uh, sorting machines were still being dismantled. I don't know about whether or not any post off uh, or, or uh, mailboxes were being removed yesterday. And it's entirely possible that DeJoy will 
try to explain some of this stuff away by saying, well, I had, you know, we had begun the dismantling of some of these mail sorting machines before you forced me to promise that we were going to stop doing that and we just needed to f complete the process. Sort of like the way uh, the Trump organization uh, promised that they wouldn't be doing any more foreign deals once Donald Trump was president, but they continued to do foreign deals and they first the excuse was well these things were already in the works we just need to conclude them and then they just started initiating brand new deals and saying what i never said we weren't going to do that same thing for DeJoy. although you know i guess uh uh greg was a little more optimistic about what they might really mean if not their actual word uh but what they might really mean in uh, what they were going to do, perhaps slowing things down until after the election or whatever. And, of course, everybody else pointing out that there was no indication that DeJoy uh, had any interest in replacing any of the equipment or mailboxes. That wasn't happening. And Pelosi picked up on that pretty quickly. But uh, even worse, right in the middle of all this, as he's promising that he's not going to do this anymore, he's caught it, the uh, in particular, the, uh, where was it? Is it... Uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan post office where WOOD TV reporters found uh, the machines dismantled and being placed out in the parking lot. So, you know, not good, basically. All right, let's see. Uh, other interesting developments. Wow, there's a couple of them. Uh, let me throw out... You could spend, again, all day reading about QAnon, but I wanted to throw out a weird problem that occurred to me, and I'm not certain I got a chance to discuss it in the last couple of days, but if if not, I would like to put this out there. Um, with, uh, Mar what's her name? Marjorie Green, right, in the Georgia House District, now the nominee for the Republicans in a very red district, and I guess for all intents and purposes, basically uh, due to show up as an elected member of Congress in January, um, I have real concerns, not only about, you know, the state of the nation and the fact that QAnon can, uh, can thrive here uh, to the extent that we're electing true believer QAnon nuts to Congress, but the danger, I'm very worried actually about the danger of seating someone like this uh, to the le it rises to the level where I think Democrats actually have to explore the possibility of, of rejecting her credentials or of refusing to seat her when she arrives in Washington in January. And I know that's a very touchy subject and not one that Democrats are going to be super uh, enthusiastic about addressing seriously. But uh, long story short, I just remind everybody, members of Congress, you know, when they're genuine and elected, you know, they all, of course, uh, well, you've seen them on TV. They're wearing those lapel pins. They have a very real purpose around the Capitol and the Capitol campus, if you will, um, identifying them as members, but entitling them not only to floor access, which would ordinarily otherwise be guarded by Capitol Police, um, but uh, they can, because of the nature of their business and the trusted status, quite frankly, that comes with being a member of Congress, you know, even if some of them don't deserve it, um, it's never really risen to the level where individual members of Congress posed such a great threat. Uh, you know, there are, are close calls. I mean, you never know what uh, Louis Gohmert is going to do. And of course, he might spread coronavirus around uh, knowingly or otherwise. And that's a danger. And occasional, uh, like really extreme cases, like way back when Steve Stockman, who was suspected of having real connections to the uh, very weird anti-government militia movement. But here you're going to have somebody who's elected, you know, overtly on the QAnon platform, getting one of these pins that entitles them to bypass Capitol Hill security because they're a member of Congress. And by the way, occasionally this happens to bring with them uh, people that they are willing to claim if they're down there personally are their guests and quite literally can bring them onto the House floor. That seems fairly obvious, but you can bypass security. You go around the metal detectors that the rest of the world has to go through when they visit a building in the Capitol complex. And 
you now have somebody who's a true believer in a movement that has, you know, uh, at its very worst, uh, brought a uh, AR-15 wielding QAnon nut to the Comet po- uh, Ping Pong and Pizza Place in Washington, D.C., insisting on freeing the uh, child sex slaves who he believed were being held in the basement there, even though they don't have a basement. And that's dangerous. We had a guy show up at the Hoover Dam, right? And I don't remember what he was uh, claiming to do. Bomb it, uh, shoot the place up. But he, too, was motivated by weird QAnon beliefs. Now we're going to give one of those people a pin that entitles them to walk onto the floor of the House of Congress around the metal detectors. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning. And I've learned that I either need to update these announcements more often or stop saying that the announcements are brand new. What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the KGRO in the Morning Show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that KGRO in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday. But our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents. One thin dime. We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to Patreon.com slash KGROX to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. All right, welcome back now to the Kid Growing the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, yeah, well, we left you with a very uh, exciting portion of uh, of my of a crescendo towards uh, warning people about a very serious danger. I, I don't know what kind of person marjorie green is beyond her belief in QAnon theories and other strange uh bigotries and conspiracy theories but uh circulating on the web the other day was a video she made of herself uh you know attempting to and you know i wouldn't say force her way in i don't think she broke any laws doing this but visiting the offices for instance of rashida tlaib and ilan omar Right to, and I think we may have made mention of this, uh, although I don't know, it's a little hazy where I might have been talking about this, but uh, visiting their offices, claiming that their um, uh, oaths of office as members of Congress were invalid because they, as she claimed, took the oath on a Koran rather than a Christian Bible. Um, and that this somehow invalidated their oath, which it would not. But also, just in point of fact, we can point out that the oath of office is actually administered in, in mass by the Speaker to the entirety of the House at the same time, and that their hands are on nothing, though some of them surely probably bring Bibles with them. People to whom this is extremely important might do that. But in the House chamber, during the actual swearing in, it's just them raising their right hands and their left hands can, I guess they could be on whatever they want. And I wouldn't put it past Republican members. Some of them, of course, will bring Bibles and some of them will put their hands on other people or on themselves in some way. And uh, not necessarily indicative of what they're swearing their allegiance to. It's just that's one of their habits. But no, uh, swearing in in the House doesn't involve a Bible or anything else. Uh, where the Bibles sometimes come into play is in the, uh, some would say fake, others uh, euphemistically say ceremonial, swearing in, uh, uh, well, ceremonies, events, what have you, in which pictures are taken, and each member gets a chance to uh, stand uh, with the Speaker of the House and stage a photo as if they were being sworn in, using the Bible, you know, their family gets to join them for the picture or perhaps hold the family Bible or whatever it is you choose to be sworn in on. The Senate does the same ones, um, you know. So it, it, there's a ceremonial thing. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I guess it shouldn't have any legal bearing whatsoever what book you choose to swear in on. And you may recall that uh, uh, Kristen Cinema. Uh, do I have it right? Is Kirsten Cinema or Kristen cinema. I never do get that correct. But anyway, that she, uh, for her uh, ceremonial swearing, and it's 
Kirsten, yeah, hmm. K Y R. Kirsten Cinema <clears throat> was uh, she brought with her, I think, a copy of the Constitution or something like that in order to be sworn in on a non-religious document. Uh, of course, we've seen it before with Muslims taking the oath. Uh, Keith Ellison, as I recall, was famously sworn in on, and not officially, but again ceremonially, on the Jefferson Koran, or the Jefferson, uh, the, the Koran that is the version of the Jefferson Bible. It was his own personal copy that exists in the House uh, or the uh, Library of Congress. Uh, Ilan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, I don't know what they did in those uh, 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 fake ceremonial swearing in ceremonies, but uh, it doesn't matter. And uh, anyway, so Marjorie Green showed up, I guess, with a Bible in hand, uh, insisting that their oaths of office had been improperly administered and that they were therefore not officially members of Congress and offering them the chance, uh, in her view, to rectify this if they would only agree on camera, on her phone camera, to swear in again, this time with their hand on a Christian Bible, which they may or may not have been willing to do. I don't really have, <laughs> have any uh, basis for knowing what they would think of such a request. I assume they would think, you know, that's ridiculous. You're wrong. Get out of here. And it's offensive as well. But, you know, who knows? Maybe Rashida Tlaib would have said, you know, it doesn't matter to me what book you put in front of me. Uh, I've already been sworn in and that's all there is to it. You want to have a fake event? If it'll satisfy you and get me, uh, you're out of, me, you out of my office, that uh, who knows what she may have agreed to. Probably not. She probably would have had him thrown out. Anyway, it didn't matter because AIDS threw them out of the office uh, quickly enough. But, uh, you know, she's a confrontational kind of person, apparently. And uh, I don't know whether she would have, uh, is she the kind of person who, you know, takes pride in being a gun owner? Maybe, probably, really no basis to judge other than who, you know, that she's a QAnon nut from Northwest Georgia. So maybe, probably. But uh, at that point, her being a nobody uh, very unlikely that Capitol Hill police would have allowed her to carry a weapon to those offices to carry out this stupid fake mission. But now, put a con uh, you know make her a member of Congress, swear her in, and give her a pin, and it's actually something she or one of her guests would be able to do if she escorts them past security. She could certainly do it herself. And now. Uh, uh, how quickly do aides from Tlaib and Omar's office throw her out if she comes in waving a pistol and insisting that they retake their oaths of office on her maybe fake Christian Bible? Well, I don't know. I don't know how, uh, how different that situation is. And again, uh, um, it's not completely out of the question. QAnon weirdos uh, have shown up and made terroristic threats all over the place. And, of course, uh, the FBI has uh, has to consider and has considered QAnon to be a, uh, a domestic terrorism threat as a result. Now you're putting one of their own in Congress. I mean, it would be, like, be the way a uh, right-wing Republican would view seating a member of Hezbollah in in Congress, if they won election, you just got to put them there. So I thought that's, uh, you know, that's something to think about. And it's a very real issue and a very real topic for discussion ahead of day one of the new Congress. But just uh, procedurally speaking, uh, it would be a very clear question of the privileges of the House when uh, there's lots of precedent for uh uh, highly privileged motions to be brought when they are questions of the physical safety of members of the House and the integrity of the proceedings of the House. I mean, really, it implicates the integrity of the proceedings as well. Although that's a harder case to make outright. But uh, physical safety. I mean, again, in addition to the fact that she can now bypass security, for the most part, wherever she wants to and bring people with her onto the House floor. Remember, she's going to be wading into a House floor where the majority of the members are members of the Democratic Party. And she's apparently sold on the wacko conspiracy theory 
that those people, Democrats in the House, are the satanic, cannibalistic, drug-harvesting pedophiles that need to be wiped out in this country. And it's, it's the mission of the QAnon conspiracy believers to take out personally. Is that safe to allow her in? I mean, we, we most likely, I think, would find that she's full of it and doesn't really believe this strongly enough to take any action on it. And really, honestly, if the, if the accusation of if the crime being accused here is cannibalistic, Satanistic, child torturing pedophilia, how do you not take personal action if you're sure you're right? That's the real worry. I, the question is how much of a true believer is she really? And, and, and we may be in the end glad for the opportunity to prove that she's not a true believer and then what wait two years for her QAnon kooks at home to reject her in a primary in favor of somebody who is a true believer and then we just have the same problem all over again uh, honestly truly we really do have to spend some time looking into it and I was reminded of that uh, even more powerfully last night as I watched Gabby Gifford's presentation to the convention and I didn't get to watch that in real time, but I watched the video afterwards, uh, you know, and of course the very striking images of her in the hospital and in recovery from her shooting. But uh, again, a uh, reminder that we're not waiting to inevitably reach the, uh, the, that point in uh in our history where we finally do see a member of congress shot by a conspiracy addled wacko carrying too much weaponry it has happened and it's not that we have forgotten that uh that this this happened but we sometimes need a reminder that this sort of thing has happened in the past and we've already reached that point uh and of course uh, our our friends on the other side, uh, not the other side of the aisle, but the other side of the ocean over in the UK will recall that uh, Joe Cox was gunned down in, in very similar fashion. We're, we're already well past the point where, yeah, conspiracy-believing wackos will show up and shoot members of Congress. What we've never gotten around to admitting is that there's... Uh, you know, a mechanism by which we can now envision without it being all that far fetched that it is a member of Congress doing the shooting. And I guess if you throw, you know, if you're willing to open yourself up to uh, throwing it way back in history, I mean, well, there was the caning of Sumner. Maybe uh, uh, that could have been a shooting, I suppose, but it wasn't. And so maybe we still think this, but there's been shootings on the House floor. That too has been a realistic, uh, I mean, it's part of history. Uh, 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 back in, what was it, the 70s? Was it Puerto Rican separatists who uh, uh, brought guns, managed to get guns into the House gallery and shoot down from the visitors' gallery onto the floor, wounding members of Congress on the floor? So it's, you know, they're not guarding against nothing or some ephemeral threat that never presents itself. People are crazy out there. Uh, but it's a very real possibility that we may be um, seating a member who's willing to either do that themselves because they feel compelled by their stupid conspiracy beliefs to do it themselves or to let some, you know, facilitate someone else doing it. They have sworn allegiance, allegedly, you know, in their stupid videos to QAnon. And I guess all it really takes, I mean, what happens if whatever wacko freaks are behind these stupid, you know, breadcrumb drops that QAnon believers think are coming from some high-level governmental insider. What happens if if Q issues those instructions or somebody pretending to be, well, they're all pretending to be Q, but pretending to be the person who's normally pretending to be Q drops, you know, the info that, yeah, there are specific members of Congress. Maybe they even name them. Specific members of Congress who are the worst offenders, a sitting member of Congress who's likely a gun owner from a wacko district 
that believes in this stuff, how do they not? Having taken the QAnon oath and all that, which is really the same oath that they take as a member of the House. And by the way, you should uh, I guess we should be listening on uh, early in January on the 6th when everybody is, is it the 6th or the 3rd that they do their swearing in? Now I can't remember anymore for some reason. But uh, when they all swear their oath, uh, will Marjorie Green shout out where we go one, we go all at the end of her oath? I don't know. But if she's the kind of person that takes these oaths, the, the QAnon fake oath, and then believes it and takes it seriously, and then QAnon drops, you know, the information that XYZ members of Congress are the worst and need to get it first. What do we do? How long do you let her just walk back and forth unchecked? I don't know. A little worrisome. Okay, so that should freak you out good. There's a a new addition to the reading that we could be doing about QAnon. I thought an interesting angle on this, although I don't think I'm going to spend the rest of the show uh, reading this one. But um, a, oh, look at this. I didn't even know that there was an article limit that you could reach for uh, the New Republic. But I guess we, we learn something new every day. QAnon, the title says, is using the anti-trafficking movement's conspiracy playbook. Melissa Gira Grant putting this one together. I don't know how she pronounces that G-I-R-A middle name. Hope I haven't mangled it too bad. Um, and uh, that might even be confusing to you because you might have thought that it, well, wasn't it QAnon that originated the idea that uh, government elites were involved in trafficking of ch- children? Uh, yes, True, but it didn't begin with them. There was, a, of course, Pizzagate, and that stupid theory actually kind of predates QAnon. QAnon has picked up that ball and run with it and just sort of adopted the Pizzagate conspiracy theory wholesale and, 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 and gone on running with it. But even before Pizzagate, there was a weird underground conspiracy theory that sur- you know sort of uh, centered on the same accusation that government and Hollywood elites were trafficking in pedophilia and needed to be stopped. And it was the province of militia stuff before then. And recall, I mean, we we heard some vague rumblings and read some stories about uh, militia types like raiding uh, southwestern desert wilderness camps that they believed were trafficking sites or somehow connected to the trade in child sex slaves, but were in fact nothing and nothing existed there at all. And it was all just another one of their delusions. But uh, this is sort of an interesting link to that as background. And I guess uh, how it was that they came to pick up the ball for these groups and try and run it forward and the nuts and bolts of it. And you might find it interesting reading. We may be able to make it interesting reading in the near future, but not uh, not a whole lot of time for uh, touching on all of that today. Let's see, other things that deserve attention that we can or should cram in. Uh, so much more to uncover from the Senate Intelligence Report, and maybe we can get to a little bit more of that. I should bring this uh, um, uh, finding from that reading forward. And I I do believe that somewhere buried in pocket for even a week or two ago, we got the same information and I never made mention of it. Now it's being mentioned again by NBC News, Ken Delanian, uh, uh, bringing this point forward from the Senate Intelligence Report. And I I think it is kind of old news, um, but just sort of hit the headlines a little while ago uh, in in an entirely separate um, in, in entirely separate grounds for criminal proceedings, Bannon's name has come up in connection with a criminal indictment in the context of what the Senate Intelligence Committee was investigating, not just the We Build the Wall thing. So the NBC News headline here, Senate Committee made criminal referral of not just Steve Bannon, but also Don, Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and two others to federal prosecutors. Now, uh, if you're 
celebrating the Bannon uh, arrest by the Southern District of New York and wondering how did that get passed, you know, how did they let that pass the uh, Attorney General and the rest of the DOJ? I don't know, but maybe it's to serve as some sort of sop or distraction from uh, their obstruction of these charges against him for uh, stemming from the, what the Senate Intelligence Committee found. The Intelligence Committee detailed its concerns in a letter to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C. in June of 2019, an official said. So you must now be scratching your head. What is it that has justified uh, burying this news for over a year? And the answer is nothing. It's just something that Bill Barr and the Justice Department felt like doing. The Republican and Democratic leaders of the Senate Intelligence Committee made criminal referrals of Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, Steve Bannon, Eric Prince, already picked up in this other charge, and Sam, well, not arrested, but in, uh, implicated, rather, and Sam Clovis also to federal prosecutors in 2019, passing along their suspicions that the men may have misled the committee during their testimony, an official familiar with the matter told NBC News. In other words, lying to Congress during the investigation. The officials confirmed reports in the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post, and that must be what I had uh, tucked away from before. Let me just open that one up and see. Is that, uh, no, nah, that's not dated so long ago, August 15th, but uh, time is warping these days. Anyway, they confirmed those reports, which uh, mentioned that uh, that matter last week, I bet that's what happened. A criminal referral to the Justice Department means Congress believes a matter warrants investigation for potential violation of the law. The committee detailed its concerns in a letter to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C. See, they should have sent it to the Southern District of New York uh, on the premise that D.C. would never act. Back in June of 2019, the Post reported that the letter was divided into two sections. One named those suspected of making false statements. That would be Bannon, Clovis, the co-chair of the Trump campaign in 2016, and Prince, who they describe only as a private security contractor. A second section raised concerns about the testimony of other witnesses, including Trump Jr. and Kushner, whose statements were contradicted by Trump campaign aide Richard Gates, although it did not pointedly make a false statements allegation, the Post reported. The LA Times reported that the committee questioned whether Bannon lied about his interactions and conversations with Prince about that meeting in the Seychelles between Prince and a top Russian official. Prince told special counsel Robert Mueller's prosecutors that he briefed Bannon on the January 2017 meeting, but Bannon said the conversation never happened. A lawyer for Prince told the Post that if there was such a referral, it did not appear to have resulted in an investigation. There has been no public indication of any investigation. Lawyers for Trump Jr., Kushner, Bannon, and Clovis have previously denied that their clients misled the committee. So some question there about, well, why was there no investigation? Was there a good reason or only nefarious reasons? Uh, well, maybe uh, the indictment of two of those folks on, or at least indictment of one and implication of another in the We Build the Wall scandal might shake some of this loose. We, we'll see. Uh, let's see. Um, other very interesting things. And let's, uh, boy, I still want to like spend some time on what's happening with the Senate report and some of the, the ridiculous fawning that Donald Trump did over Vladimir Putin and his letters to Putin. But it uh, uh, seems like it's less important than these things. And maybe let's throw two pieces together if we can. Uh, first, there was uh, another report on the wargaming of electoral college and election chaos brought about by Donald Trump's undermining uh, and questioning the integrity of the election and challenging um, the, uh, well, everything that will happen about the election, the validity of ballots, the validity of the electoral college count, what have you. Uh, two treatments of that in the last couple of days. Uh, I know we've talked about the wargaming thing in the past. I think we had, what, David Frum weighing in on this. Here's one from Vox, Zach Beauchamp, writing this piece back on the 18th. 
How to Avert a Post-Election Nightmare. That sounds like a good idea. A war game that tried to simulate the 2020 transition, this time ended in violence. Not actual violence between the war gamers, but uh, again, the war game showed that it would uh, likely, the, the scenario of the election, devolve into violence. One of its organizers explains how to prevent that. And that's nice. This is a rather lengthy piece and an important one. But I want to at least bring to your attention the headline of the other. And we'll see what we can cram in here. Uh, Who brought this one up this morning? Uh, uh, Oh, Karen. And uh, uh, I've never did we straighten this out? Karen SF. Are you in San Francisco or is that your last name and middle initial? I can't I can't recall how we settled on that. But Karen is a frequent listener to the show and uh, one of the uh, many objectors to uh, the uh, unfortunate use of her name in in branding annoying people around the country. We feel for you there. But uh, pointed me to this Newsweek article, which. put together by Tim Worth and Tom Rogers. And I think this is their second entry in this, in a, you know, a series of warnings about things that could go terribly wrong and what to do about it. Tim Worth, of course, uh, a former Senator and house member from Colorado. So, you know, no, uh, well, I would say no out of left field crank, but now we're about to see QAnon members. So I guess that calls everybody into question. Uh, but this second effort here was interesting. How to defeat Trump's plan to overturn the election. And I think they take two slightly different approaches to it, but uh, not entirely sure. Well, let's see. I'll read you the Vox intro and uh, we'll talk about it just briefly while we uh, get ready to exit and hand things over to justice here. Uh, back over at Vox, Zach Beauchamp. Imagine that after a narrow Joe Biden victory in November's election, Donald Trump refuses to concede defeat, citing, among other things, alleged voter fraud and mail-in ballots. Imagine that this goes on for months, right up until Inauguration Day in January. Some closer read details uh, from Worth, uh, for instance, uh, I think he was the one that floated the idea of sending alternative electoral college slates from some red states controlled uh, in their state legislatures uh, and, and their governor's mansions by Republicans, saying essentially, um, sure, Joe Biden won the vote in our state, but we allege fraud and we're going to send a Republican electoral college slate alongside the democratic one and it'll be up to congress to decide which vote to accept all right uh beauchamp over in vox is writing more about um the war gaming that has gone on that uh, i guess drove people to realize that this could be the outcome uh worth and rogers are talking more about how to resolve this situation, you'll recall that if there are alternative slates sent, the Congress will have to decide which votes to count. And sometimes uh, the process is very similar in many ways or can be very similar to the process by which a tie in the Electoral College is settled or a, an Electoral College count that has no one getting the majority of 270 votes that are necessary to win. Maybe just, you know, we, we can't tie the thing, but we can tie it up and give no one 270 by disputing the validity of some of Joe Biden's electoral votes in these states where two slates show up. Uh, so Worth and Rogers suggest that there's a way around this. But we've learned uh, that one of the real dangers is that the, the, the voting is done by delegation in the House where they select a new president and uh, a ma- slight majority of the state delegations are dominated by Republicans because of their gerrymandering, et cetera, uh, and uh, at-large seats in very red states, things like that. But they point out that uh, if the control of the Senate turns over, but with very specific goals in mind, five Senate seats, if the, if the Democrats were to gain five Senate seats so that they could, they would have to out, be able to outvote Senate Republicans plus the person who would still be vice president, Mike Pence. So you need five more votes, flipping five Senate seats, 
and flipping some strategically selected seats in swing states. And I think there just uh, three or four seats would need to be flipped in one in Pennsylvania. I think the at-large seat in, is it Montana that they name? And uh, yeah, uh, a couple of other places around the country. They have some very specific targeting about which seats would be flipped. It would take one seat in each of these very few states to be flipped, and some of them are actually gettable, that would change the control of the state delegation and change the vote such that Democrats would be able to overcome the strategic voting of Republicans and have a majority in the House and be able to defeat a majority or, or defeat the Republicans and have a big enough majority to do it in the Senate as well and thwart all of this. It's kind of out there in terms of long shots, uh, you know, in terms of that actually happening or it, it coming to that point. But the states and seats that they suggest flipping are not outlandish all by themselves. After all, it's very interesting. And we recommend you take a look. From Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the k in the Morning Show. With David Waltman. Well, don't worry if you don't take a look, because I have a feeling that we'll want to take a look. Maybe tomorrow will be a good day for that. Uh, but if we don't get to it, at least you'll have those articles on hand. Now stay tuned for Justice Putnam to pick things up and pick up all the news that I didn't get to, including the big bombshell about Goodyear and Donald Trump stepping in it in Ohio. <laughs> 